Hello internet and welcome to episode 47, Agent 47 in fact, of the Sounds of Stadia podcast. You're joining myself, Chris, one of your hosts, alongside my lovely co-host to my left, your right, Mr. Techie Teacher himself in the Purple Cube. Tom, welcome back for another week, sir. The Purple Cube. The... Yeah, no, I'm sort of settling on this purple colour, aren't I really? Like, mm, I haven't it, really thought about it. Is it purple or is it blue and just the light? twists it um it's sort of like it's sort of like a bluey purple actually it is it is sort of sitting in the middle there but it was just just hit a button on a remote and it set that color so i'm happy with that well indigo yeah and if we go below the purple cube we've got the man with his guitars the man of many pixels mr richie once again i'm not shaving my head for this episode (laughs) was that a requirement the Indian 47 reference. Oh, okay. Ah, okay, okay. Well, Caught us out with that one, I was thinking. Yeah. Did, we, did we ask Richie to shave his head? <laughs> I didn't recall that being a thing. But yeah, uh, bear in mind, there is no Agent 47 Hitman news or <laughs> anything this week yeah. to do with it. It just happens to land on Agent 47. And if we remember from our 007 episode, gentlemen, no one likes it when you focus the entire episode on a number-based thing. So <laughs> we'll just move on from that. If you are new to the show, don't forget to give us a like down below and a subscribe to the channel so you are kept in the loop with what is the Sounds of Stadia podcast. It just so happens to be the longest UK Stadia-centric running podcast in the world. In the world. We did a little calculation this morning and we're pretty sure we are. We're up to number 47 right now. Coming up on that one-year anniversary, gentlemen, we'll have to uh, put our heads together and think of some magical celebration we could do. Uh, Mm. Maybe we could shave Richie's head. Who knows? (laughs) Maybe we could shave your head and your beard, then glue your beard to your head. Yeah, why not? <laughs> <laughs> you heard it here first, folks. You heard it here first. Wow. Wonderful. Wow, okay. Um, That's commitment. But as I mentioned, this is the Sounds of Stadia podcast. Every week we bring you a roundup of the gaming news, uh, Stadia-centric or otherwise, wherever it's pertinent to the particular platform, from myself, Chris, Tom and Richie. This week we've got a bumper week once again lined up for you all. Uh, we're going to talk about... Um, Epic having a bit of a problematic time with some massive multi-corporate companies. We're going to talk about uh, the Embrace Group acquiring certain businesses that relate to Stadia. Uh, We've got some new gameplay announcements, some new details for some upcoming titles, uh, some juicy news, and of course, some stuff that could only happen on Stadia. So stay tuned, and we'll be talking about all that. But first things first, you two lovely gentlemen, what have we been up to, housekeeping-wise? Monster Boy, I'm getting there, Tom. I'm getting yes, there. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Part seven, um, I turned into a lion this week. I did indeed. I made loads of Lion King references and puns over on Twitter. <laughs> it's hard to think of names and titles for these videos sometimes. I don't just want to have it as Monster Boy part whatever, because that just it's quite mundane. I want to try and make it a bit more episodic centric. Yeah. Um, how far from the end would you say I am now? You're still a fair distance, I'd say. Okay. So yeah, it's... you're probably, you're probably <laughs> sitting around about... I want to say about 60% of the game, you've still got a fair bit to go. Okay, okay. Mm. Well, I've got a week off work, so I could get a few episodes in the can for this one. But uh, keep tuned every Saturday. I'll come to you with that lovely uh, cartoon action and uh, many, many deaths. Many, many deaths. Many deaths. Many, (laughs) many deaths. Many, many deaths. Um, And of course... Is that a death counter? (laughs) No, it's beyond that, Richie. There's not enough digits in there. You need like a a (laughs) pie, infinite logo to go on for that. Um, this week I also jumped in and checked out Rock of Ages because I know Tom you were super excited for this one so I thought I'll jump in and I'll give everyone a first look so head over to the channel for my first look at Rock of Ages 3 Make and Break um, very Monty Python-esque um, have you had a chance to jump in and mess around with it yet? it obviously launched this midweek either yeah. of you two played on it? no um, I, I was thinking about trying to get in this weekend but just didn't get around to it so far I picked it up on the um, on the day it came out, so on the 14th, so just a couple of days ago. I was actually in Liverpool over the weekend, just um, just for some time away, really. And fortunately, m- finally managed to get to try out some 5G, which uh, we'll we'll talk about later mm. on. Um, picked up Rock of Ages, sat down on my phone, played through that a little bit, and um, yeah, I, I got through the first little bit. It, it it takes a bit of time to get used to. It is a fun game, but I think. Um, you know, we'll we'll talk about our thoughts about that another time on a separate video. But uh, it, it needs a bit of polishing, I think. It needs a bit of polishing, but it's still fun. Don't polish it too much. Too, too slow, so you just need to polish it a bit more. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm. Too much just friction. Polish that lane down like a bowling alley. <laughs> yeah, um, you go check out my first impressions of it. Uh, there's definitely a learning curve that I don't think the game yeah. 
lends itself very well to teaching you. Um, personally, I would. I know level one is basically here's how you roll the ball and this is the the gameplay, and then very quickly it throws you into this is the castle defense kind of mechanics. And I personally probably would have rather enjoyed a few more levels of the the action element of it rather than being flung straight into the mechanics of castle defense because yeah, it just it was quite a stark contrast between. It was almost felt like I was playing two separate games. Yeah, um, I think that was sort of my experience as well. Um, it was a game I was very much looking forward to, and I'll probably sit down and play a little bit more. But I think in terms of not just a learning curve, but also a difficulty curve, mm -hmm. once you get through the tutorial, you're very much thrown into it, and all of a sudden the difficulty just spikes massively because not only have you got those tower defense modes that you experienced as well, but there's also like a war mode too, which is where um, two parties, the two, the two people battling against each other, are both simultaneously building and defending um and you have to wait for your boulder to sort of like go through a time before you can launch it mm. and while you're waiting for your boulder to launch you need to set up your course to, pre uh, to prevent the enemy from attacking you and it's very very fast paced and you've got to be so on it yeah. but Is i do it think of too many mechanics too quickly kind of thing yeah and it doesn't really explain all of the mechanics so um one big thing that i i noticed with with Chris's reaction video, and you'll see it in the comments because I just wanted to throw it straight in there for anybody who hasn't played the game yet, is using the towers. People some, people are using the towers and suddenly just like placing one tower here, one tower there, one tower there. But you very quickly learn that the towers do absolutely F all. Really absolutely don't. nothing. So what you actually need to do is you need to hold down the A button and drag the tower from one position to another and it constructs a wall and it's the wall oh, yeah. that slows things down instead. It's like an Age of Empires 2 where you just put the one thing but you need to drag it yeah. to get it from yes. the wall. But, but I it naturally, doesn't explain it. Yeah, yeah, I naturally just thought it, it was a turret. The little icon looked like mm. a turret. Yeah. I placed the turret. Some people showed up around it and then, yeah, the boulders just smashed their hell through those things. I was like, well, they're crap. They're useless. <laughs> um, what are you thinking? This is a tower defense style game. This is a tower. A literal It'll tower. shoot things at the yeah. boulder. But uh, yeah. go, go check it out. Again, it's a free pro mm. game, so who am I to deny? I certainly would have, wouldn't not have bought the game, so it was great to jump in and check that out as well. Uh, speaking of new things we played, Richie, you joined myself this past yeah. Thursday, as promised, for some more... For, well, not some more. Some Strange Brigade action. Strange uh, yeah. Brigade! We had a ton of fun. <laughs> yeah, uh, we, we played for nearly four hours. <laughs> it was just... <laughs> we got into it, we picked our characters, and we went through, yeah... Um, Mumma 5, 1930s, with some Explorer, twirl your moustache action. Uh, super fun. Uh, I'm happy to jump back in again this Thursday, to be fair, yeah, in our weekly stream really slot. Fun. Um, and I guess there is spare spaces. So, Tom, if your adventure um, life will allow it, you can uh, join us in Strange Brigade. <laughs> um, but even if you are there or not able to join us, uh, we need help. We need a full team. Me and Richie start getting so far and the difficulty yeah. seemed to get a bit more... Yeah. stronger where we would require more help so if you are listening to this show screwed right now a few times by minotaurs yeah or minotaurs we discussed what what do you call them tom i'd probably call it a minotaur i always feel like minotaur was yeah. everyone called it that and then as pop culture and american television is getting more yeah minotaur, i think that's I the problem went, i think it's, I it's been americanized until assassin's creed odyssey mm. and they were always going minotaur so i wonder if that's closer to the actual greek pronunciation interesting possibly but yeah. either way we'll be jumping back in this thursday for our weekly live stream and we need your help so jump into the chat if you've got the game i mean if you've got the game you should do if you're a stadium fan and a player and a pro yeah. subscriber uh you'll have it for free already so jump in and help us out as our third or fourth member um uh, this thursday probably about 8 p.m uk time check us out for that stream as well uh, but that's it for housekeeping uh we do have one subject i'd like to get onto before we jump into the news and that is tom You've uh, yeah, made so. the switch, the you, the final nail in the coffin switch, which just, does actually pertain to our first story of the week as well. Um, you made the switch from iOS, Apple, over to Android, and you picked up a nice new shiny phone. Uh, you've had I it did. for about a week or so now, and you've been away, so. you've been able to test it on 4G, 5G, you got yourself the Kishi um, uh, the peripheral as well. Yeah. Give us your thoughts. How is life on the Ooh. move, gaming on the move, using the power of Stadia mm -hmm. right now? Um, it's it's great, if I'm going to be honest with you. Uh, the transition from iOS to Android was actually really slick. Like, I thought it was going to be really difficult to actually sort of make that change because even though I'm quite a techie person and I sort of embrace a lot of different types of technology, different operating systems and computers and so on, um, I have not really done that with phones. I've sort of bought into the Apple 
um, ecosystem stuck with that ever since day one, really. So to actually make that jump from Apple to, to well, from iOS to Android is, to me, it's kind of a big thing because I've never actually done that before. But they really have thought about the, um, the, the, the user base essentially transitioning across from one platform to another. And I've actually found it actually to be really sort of like self-explanatory. When I think of Android, I think about things that require people to be a little bit more hands-on and have a little bit more knowledge about what they're working with. But the reality is they've definitely tried to, for lack of a better way of putting it, dumbed it down, I suppose, to make it a little bit more accessible to the end user. In terms of gaming and so on, I mean, this has been fantastic. So I picked up the Galaxy S20 Plus, which um, it is the 5G unit. We haven't got full rollout of 5G in the UK at the moment, but I have had the opportunity to test it out. I tested it over while I was in Liverpool and I was picking up speeds of about 250 meg per second, which meant that I could get everything that I needed to on Stadia, really. The other thing I would say about this phone in particular as well with the Galaxy range, I'm not sure if they've done this on the Pixel, so you'll have to correct me if I'm wrong. But the, uh, the S20 Plus comes with a 120 hertz refresh rate as well on the screen, which means that everything just moves really slick in terms of moving through menus and gameplay. It's just almost like, um, if you think about your frame rates in video games, your 30 FPS, your 60 FPS, and so on there, your screen also has to refresh at that rate as well. So not only how many frames the game generates, but how many frames the screen can actually process at any one time. So having 120 hertz uh, refresh rate is really, really nice because everything just flows really smoothly. Um, I think the mm -hmm. Pixel 4 and the Pixel 4 XL is capped at 90. Okay, 90 is still good. It's better than the base yeah. 60. But um, no, it's been fantastic. Um, I've tried out the touch controls. I've tried out the Razer Kishi as well. I'm working on a video on the site so you can expect to see that this week as well um, of my thoughts about the Razer Kishi. But um, initial thought, a bit of a taster for you. It's It's good. It's really, really good. I had a few initial issues, but they've been they've been sorted now. I'm going to talk about those in the video too. But I would strongly recommend anybody who is thinking about moving from um, from iOS to Android, if you are a Stadia gamer or if you're thinking about getting into XCloud or any of the cloud gaming, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna be bold and say I'm gonna do it. Like do it. I would definitely consider doing it because, you know, there's a lot of things we're going to be talking about in relation to Apple this week. And I think these are things that we all need to consider about going forwards. Uh, we talked about some stuff last week as well in relation to Apple not really supporting cloud gaming. I, I think that's pretty much been solidified by the events that have transpired over the past week as well. But my overall experience has been absolutely top. I definitely recommend it. Wonderful, wonderful stuff. Welcome to the dark side. <laughs> yeah. Or the light side. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> From a certain point of view, Richie. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'd say the Apple's the light side because most of the products are white, where the most are Android they? phones come. Yeah. Are they? Uh, an iPhone's usually white. When you think of an iPhone, you think mm, of a white no. phone. No, I don't think. Really? Do. Space <laughs> Gray <laughs> has been their most prominent color for. Yeah. Aside from the rose gold variant, Space Gray is the default. I get what you're talking about, though. They've got Apple yeah. have got very much the branding of using like the white logo on a solid color background or vice versa, a white background with a solid dark color logo in the middle as well. So but either way, there's still a massive conglomerate yeah. business. So by default, they're yes. the dark side, right? <laughs> 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 Along with Google and Amazon and every other massive company. Everyone's um, on the dark side. We're about to talk about. But before we talk about that, Tom, we need you to give us a set and roll call noise. The super sexy special Stadia story segment, a.k.a. The, the news, news. Ah, and one hell of a week ah. in news <laughs> news ah. it news has ah. really been uh right off the back of that talking about switching from ios to android um the kind of all hell broke loose this week in the world of gaming and large corporations and we've said on the show many many times they're quite often at each other's, other's throats these businesses even though they have deals on the side and they work in tandem, patents, copyright lawsuits. It's basically just a big game of tennis for them. They sock a million dollars one way, it comes straight back to them, and vice versa. But this week, uh, the gaming industry got very, very involved with it, which, as we all know, as all of you probably listeners out there, is the biggest form of media entertainment in the world. It surpasses music, it surpasses cinema, television. It makes more money, GTA alone probably makes more money than all of those uh, by, by its own rights. But this week, uh, both Epic Game Store was removed from iOS, um, Apple's App Store, and the Google Play Store. 
And yeah, kind of just shit hit the fan with this one, gentlemen, where <laughs> Epic Tim Sweeney came out and basically said, we don't approve of their business methods. They're taking a massive cut, 30%, I believe is the number being flung around. And yeah, they pulled it. They pulled it. And this this has basically caused this big, massive uproar and saying who's right, who's wrong. But essentially, probably one of the biggest, richest companies in the world in terms of games right now, Epic, are standing their ground and saying, no, 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 your business practices are not right. We're just not going to be on your app store. And Apple kicked them did, off because of their rules. Did Epic pull it or did... Uh, I think we need to look at the, the Apple and the Google stuff separate. Um, but did Epic pull it or did um, Google well, pull it? From what my understanding is, Epic made the change to the in-app where basically you could buy V-Bucks for Fortnite yeah. through the app, basically negating the whole app store process at a 20% yeah. discounted rate. So the incentive bre- was to just buy it breach of the um, app store which is a breach of the ter- uh, um, which is a breach of Google's Play Store's terms of service. Yeah, and so Apple's Google app store service. and Apple. Yeah, yeah. Um, but then this goes back to business practices, and if it's fair, when we uh, we discussed it, we touched on it last week when yeah. the, the rumours were coming about of it. Um, any more thoughts on this one? Tom and Richie <laughs> there's, specifically. There's a, we're, <laughs> yeah. we're mainly getting this from a Verge article, and there was two things that the kind of summing up what the, the lawsuits are about monopoly control of the distribution of software to the platform and monopoly control of the payment systems within the software this is why i think we need the first one of them is why we need to look at google and apple separately because i don't think google have a monopoly control of the distribution of software to android phones as um epic themselves say after 18 months of operating Fortnite and Android outside of the Google Play Store, we've come to a basic realization that um, Google puts the software downloadable outside the Play Store at a disadvantage. Well, yeah. <laughs> like, mm. obvious statement is obvious statement. This is, but with Apple, they've got a point on that one because, well, you have to go through the iStore. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, iOS has always been based on security and Apple have always prided yeah. themselves on, on keeping everything safe and secure yeah, right. within their ecosystem and that's why everything works so well cross-pollinated across iPads and all devices. The reason I've I've always been a big Android fan is that open source material as someone who's been into gaming and customization and I remember even just when the original iPhones came out I was really frustrated at the lack of ability to just move icons around on my home screen whereas you could you could do it on every Android device so yeah. even having your I own think- background or ringtone that what didn't have to be purchased through the ios store um was my big switch over many many moons ago but you're totally right there richie in saying yeah if you wanted to download the epic app on android you would simply go to the website download the file and install it on your phone you wouldn't have to even go through the yeah. play store ios doesn't have such a luxury unless you jailbreak the phone which is why this is now yeah. basically taking millions of people off the table and they are not going to be able to access epic or fortnite through an ios device which is a lot of people, it's a, as we discussed last week, it's a big market share to leave on the floor when it comes to the millions and millions of pounds, dollars that are out there to be made. My overarching thought on reading this article is this is a big business, not getting as much money as they wanted. <laughs> or when they were out looking at, I'll, I'll focus in on the Google side of it because the Apple side of it is, I think they've got more of a justifiable I'll, point. I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll comment on that in a moment. Yeah, um, well, the Google side is they were operating outside the Google store weren't happy with the money, the, the, probably the install rate. So they put themselves on the Google Store, changed the te- changed the, the software to breach Google Center service, and now kicking up a fuss because they probably just weren't earning enough money off it. This is big business, really being big business, to be honest. That's mm-hmm. my overall thoughts on this. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So first things first, I'm going to lay down the situation. Um, the the reason that Tim Sweeney and Epic are not happy is because they that um, Google and Apple, through purchases made through the Google Play Store or the App Store, make a th- take a 30% cut of all profits that are, that are made through an app. Um, that's why the purchases have to be routed through that. Um, that's not unheard of. Steam does exactly the same thing. Yeah. That, that's Epic. not unheard of. Epic does the same thing. Yeah. With the- it's- it's not unheard of. This is literally, as you said, Richie, big business yeah. being biz- big business. They want to increase their profits and just drop their costs, essentially, which, yeah. you know, that's what businesses exist for, yeah. right? Um, yeah. But what Epic have done, quite frankly, in my personal opinion, this is my opinion alone. I don't speak for other people um, or, or the two of you here, but they have 
they have absolutely just breached the guidelines that are set. That they, they have agreed yeah. to those terms and conditions. They have followed them for what was it, eighteen months or so? Mm. It was and... eighteen months when they went through the Play Store. Mm. So I don't know how long they right. were on the Play Store for. It's so, about a year uh, or so, if, if give or take, okay. from what I've heard. Okay, but now they've basically just underhanded the the terms and conditions essentially like the license yeah. the licensing agreement that they have in place they've just underhanded like just underhanded cut it out there and that's bad practice in my personal opinion you know they've agreed to a set uh, to set terms they knew what they were getting into and they've gone behind the scenes to do it now i understand their reasoning for it and the way they've marketed it in yeah. in fact i actually think it's kind of kind of sly the way they did it so in in Fortnite, they actually put up one of those big cinema screens and actually broadcast a um a video Hashtag. message and yeah um it's like free Fortnite or yeah. something like that but they actually created a um george um george orwell 1984 except they renamed it 1980 Fortnite. um sort of like branded message to basically say that these big businesses shouldn't be allowed to take these sorts of cuts well, I'm sorry, but you agreed to them in the first place. But I think Epic are referring to themselves as if they're not a big business. Yeah. They're massive. They're, they are arguably <laughs> one of, like, outside of Tencent in China, one yeah. of probably the biggest companies in, like, globally. <laughs> and, like, look at the success of Fortnite alone, globally. For, Fortnite aside, Unreal Engine. Yeah. Absolutely. That's Epic. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, they, they are huge. Yeah. Again, this um, is a big for me, they're just I... using like a legal. They've created the legal position to try and leverage to for, use the courts to leverage Google's to change their policies. And I don't think in any way whatsoever that this is going to succeed. I, I don't see how, under any circumstances, that this can be changed. It might well... spark change in terms of like the the thoughts about like the um, capping, perhaps the amount that um, platform owners can actually charge hmm. yeah. in terms of business rates and so on. But I don't really see how this is going to really on, impact them business to business. Yeah. On the Google side, I agree, because Google can always just point out and go, you yourself have stated that you, you had your um, software on Android phones for 18 months without using the Google Play Store. You're free to do that again. Yeah. The Apple argument is different because that option is not available. So then they, if Apple do have an effective monopoly, which should be looked at as a very different scenario. Yeah, it's it's kind of opens it up to the wider question where you're completely right, Tom, in what you addressed there, saying like you agree to these business practices, and part of me thinks, well, these two storefronts, both Apple and Google, they're ran by Apple and Google, so it doesn't give another business any given right to be on sale on that platform. It's the same with like retail. Just because you own a product doesn't give you the right to put it on everybody's shelves and shops. It's like it's yeah. it's not your storefront. <laughs> um, it goes back to I think Google were fined millions by the European Union last year for breach of um, consumer laws of when you Google. Google, like, say, I don't know, I'm trying to think, a nice colourful hat, it would bring you up their search engine results before the competition, and they got fined millions upon millions for that. My personal take on that, it's their bloody storefront. They can promote their own stuff within it if they want to. It's their yeah. storefront. Alas, apparently it's, it's not consumer-friendly, which obviously it's not. However, well, back to what we're talking about here, is you're right, business practices aside, they've breached the rules they agreed to, so... yeah. You kind of have yep. to be on Apple and Google's side here, but um, when for it comes point, to yes. yeah, for that point, when it comes yeah. down to smaller developers, um, I've seen a lot of people on Twitter online basically saying that it needed a company the size of Epic to do this to actually get any traction yeah. or see any potential movement because all of the the small like one person, two person indie development teams who make apps for games, then being uh, stripped of 30% of their income is a big chunk for like one or two individuals on the smaller mm. side. Yes, to Epic, it may be like chunk change. I mean, we say chunk mm. change, but we're talking millions upon millions. But yeah. it, is a big, it is a big cut of money to take for essentially doing nothing other than yeah. having there's it digitally of, distributed. I think too often are we quick to just assume that there's a single motivation. Epic probably have multiple mo motivations within that company to have made this move. Mm. Um, they probably are thinking about some of the smaller developers to to a degree, but I, I think you just need to move away from. Not be careful, not going Epic good, Google bad, or Apple <laughs> bad, etc. Food and good, all, yeah. <laughs> what we need as well is realize this is actually very complicated stuff we're talking about because we're talking about as this digital retailer effectively that operates globally. But even different states in the US have different laws in terms of things like monopolization and like what can and can't do. 
Mm-hmm. So there's going to be, especially the Apple side, the Apple side's a bit more, I think, clear cut. Apple do seemingly have an effective monopoly because if you have an Apple phone, you have to use their store to get anything. That's so, different to the Google side. So I would is. take these cases very differently. It's also quite interesting if you think about the actual consumer base for for, for Epic products in general. And, and, and let's be honest, most of that is Fortnite. Um, as a teacher, I see lots of students owning phones and a lot of those students, particularly in the lower year groups at secondary school do, um, so talking like the ages of like 11 through to, to, to 16, um, they would probably be invested in one way or another in Fortnite. It, it's the big thing with kids, right? Like yeah. that and Minecraft um, and Roblox to a certain extent. Um, but most of those students, I would say also own iPhones. They don't own Android phones. They don't own um, OnePlus. They don't own Samsung. They don't own Google phones um, and many other different brands that are out there on the market. So effectively what's happened here is now all of those all of those um, young gamers out there who were playing Fortnite and may not may not so much have been spending money on V-Bucks, which this sort of comes down to at the end of the day, but the parents probably do at some point, one way or another. Um, they can no longer play Fortnite on their phone. It's gone <laughs> on, from, from iOS. It's, it's just gone. It doesn't exist anymore. If you had the app, it no longer works on iOS. Um, so the question to me, or the question that I'm thinking at this point then is, what happens to that user base? Because most of them probably play on mobile. They probably don't play on, on PC. There will probably be some who do play on console as well. In, in fact, I imagine a large, a large chunk of them do. But then that also makes me move over to the argument then of what about the PlayStation Store and the Xbox Store? Do they have some sort of agreement in place that works in a roundabout way? Why aren't they being targeted as well, if that is the case by, by That's Epic? That's a good point. Because at that point, then that, that gets me thinking, is Epic targeting Google and Apple because of, is, is it because of higher percentages or is it because they want to try to negate the, the dominance of Apple and Google in the mobile marketplace and start to get people moving to, as you said before, Richie, like direct downloads for, for games instead, rather than through, um, you know, mediated platforms. Mm. I think there's, I think there's mm. a lot more behind the scenes to this argument in particular that people that, you know, that isn't there's, being reported as well. There's a lot of complicated motivations into what's led them to make these decisions. Yeah. But I think the console thing is an interesting thing to consider because to me, at the, at the end of the day, what, Epic, what Epic's end goal is, is they want to get everybody into the Epic store and getting everything through, through Epic's own storefront because that way they get 100% of the profits. Um, so if anything were to happen with this Google and Apple lawsuit, does the attention then turn to Microsoft and Sony, which I don't think that's a smart move at all. <laughs> But I, I, if it, it sort of it sort of raises more questions mm, if you get think, where I'm going with it. I think they're probably more willing to take the risk on mobile because I I kind of think the mobile the user base on mobile is probably dwarfed by the console user base, and there's probably a lot of crossover okay. anyway. Okay. Um, I, I think you're probably most likely to play Fortnite on your phone if you're already playing it on PlayStation or Xbox. I'd be interested to see what um what I, I might what be I'm... wrong, but yeah. Mm. I'd be interested um, to see what the yeah. community think about that, though. So yeah. um, let us know. Let us know what your thoughts are in the comments as well, please. Yeah, I, I, I kind of think what's probably going to happen is I think with the Google stuff, it might just be a financial settlement outside of court. I really think that's just the way it's going to go. Or they, they agree a, a specific a bespoke deal where we'll only take 20% of a cut rather than 30%, that sort of idea. Mm. Apple mm. could be a very different story because it might force legislators. And I think it's California they're looking at this. To really look into Apple's business practices on the um, on the iPhone and the store specifically. Yeah, I mean it's, that could be a bigger story there. Yeah. This could be the root of something bigger. The the whole story about business practices has been kind of a thing bubbling under the surface for quite some time, and whether it's in yeah. relation to gaming or just paying taxes correctly yeah. and, and other practices like why is one company so rich in comparison to others and having that monopoly in that storefront definitely yeah. helps that um obviously capitalism at its finest ladies and gentlemen <laughs> yeah. but 
on the flip side of all these things, my to bring it back around full circle, is all these practices and all these things in regard to blocking. I think it's it's highlighted, if not more, this week because it came right off the back of them not allowing Microsoft to have xCloud and by situational chance Stadia also being on their app store. So now the spotlight is definitely switched to kind of controlling these storefronts and it just kind of like it just seems like hit after hit and like the light is now being shone upon like well why do they gatekeep it why do they control it why are they the people who prevent millions upon millions of people accessing this stuff because the turnaround of that would be um tom you said about the epic store kind of came out of nowhere the last few years because they have the millions of money um if you could play stadia or xbox you could then play fortnite through the mobile thing but them apps are also books so are you saying that the Eye of Sauron is firmly fixed upon <laughs> Apple right now? <laughs> I mean, it seems to be from everything I can see, but it, it yeah, just makes you I think agree. if the Epic app was blocked, but xCloud and Stadia were okay, then you could play Fortnite through there. Well, and kind of, But mm-hmm. again, that's another thing. So now you've got a question, is Apple blocking them all for the same reasons, or is it different rules for one and different rules for the other? And Google by association, but they'd be stupid to block Stadia. <laughs> yeah. So it's um it does it raises a lot of questions, mm. but sort of bringing this back on topic with it being a stadia centric pod- podcast, <laughs> yeah. um, I sort of feel like Epic targeting Google here. I know again Google has a lot of like it's a lot of different divisions within it, but this sort of also highlights to me that Epic are not prepared to work with Google at the moment in terms of you know releasing their products, releasing their games on uh, onto Google platforms, or or particularly they're looking at sort of trying to wrestle control back before they consider anything there. Well, we talked last week about how um, they, they've, they've said that Fortnite isn't going to be coming to Stadia anytime soon because of the number base. This sort of solidifies that that sort of argument that, that Fortnite is not coming anytime soon to Stadia at the moment. I, I think reading behind the scenes, I think the main thing why, why Epic are less inclined to play ball with Google is they're trying to position their, the Epic store to be a direct com- competitor to Steam. Yeah. Google's probably stepping in the way a bit on that. Mm. Especially if they brought something if they brought Fortnite to Stadia, yeah, why would anyone go to the Epic Store? That'll be part of their thought thought process. Yeah. yeah. It's all change, it's all change, but it is yeah. all swings and roundabouts and this is what happens. Money gets exchanged, businesses change, businesses evolve and uh, we'll just we'll definitely keep an eye on this one. Uh, yeah, I think it is one of them. This is probably it's either this is just routine business going doing businessy things and it's been amplified by last week's stories about Mm -hmm. apple and cloud streaming or this is the beginnings of a bigger story potentially i certainly think so but we shall see so big story aside moving on to another little story which i think slipped under the net for a lot of people this week um the embracer group um is a it's a again more millions and millions of pounds and dollars being shared around uh this week they acquired uh, they're also part of the sorry. They own the THQ Nordic group, which we know yeah. has been just a big blob of games, it's just absorbing title it's after in, title. It's, it's the black hole of the gaming it universe. Really is. <laughs> it's in, yeah, since THQ Nordic like rose as like a phoenix company, they just started buying everything yeah, that was up for sale. Anyone in its gravitational pull is just oh shit, we're in, oh we're owned by them now. We're now a subsidiary yeah. of THQ <laughs> yeah. Nordic. Um, talk about. Talk about conglomerate groups. Well, exactly. I'd love to see the, I'd love to see their like financial statements because yeah. they must be a very interesting. Ups and downs, ups and downs. And we know they've put out so SpongeBob, uh, Rehydrated one was one of theirs. Um, if I'm not mistaken, Destroy All Humans was part of their grand. See now every triple A, double mm. A title, I kind of just envisage being part of THQ Nordic at this point. Uh, you double check on that for me. Uh, I can see a type and Tom. Yeah, run that. Yeah, THQ hey, Nordic. Hey. Yeah. Check. Um, so as you can see, basically anything that's not AAA or indie is owned by THQ Nordic <laughs> across the middle of the board. We're, or, or be, will be. Yeah, to be fair, we're we're even like pushing it, just mentioning them on the podcast. We could yeah. be absorbed by THQ Nordic just for talking yeah. about them. I can feel that pull sucking us <laughs> away yeah, towards yeah. it. Um, but to the actual story itself <laughs> is yeah the Embracer Group who owns THQ Nordic. Uh, they picked up four A games. Uh, Decker Games or DCA, uh, DECA Games, New World Interactive, Palindrome Interactive, Pow 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 Wow Entertainment, Rare Earth Games, not to be mistaken for Rare Entertainment, Solar Media, and Vanilla Studios in one fell swoop, gentlemen. They've got eight new acquisitions once again. But the biggest thing for me is 4A are obviously the developers behind the Metro franchise. 
yeah. which are all available on Stadia now. So in terms of Stadia news, this could be big going forward in terms of ongoing relationships and partners. Um, but more importantly, the games they're talking about working on next is a another AAA production valued game um, from Sabre Interactive, who's the publishing partner, uh, for future Stadia games. This is, I mean, is it good news? Is it bad news? Is it kind of just... It doesn't really impact Stadia at this point. You'd like to think it doesn't really change anything that's yeah. set in place. But, yeah, I kind of feel like this one went under the radar a little bit. The main thing for me, mm. why I think it probably has went under the radar a bit, is these are all very small studios. I don't, apart from 4A, I don't think I've really heard of any of the games that these guys have produced. It's all the media. I don't think it's even a game studio. Yeah, um, interesting. Yeah, actually, you're right, Richie. It's a sales agent of international film and yeah. TV right distribution for children and family films around the globe. Um, it's also, yeah, it's through the Kosh Film label, which is another one they own. But this is where business practices yeah. kind of become a bit weird, where everything's kind of hidden between 20 different cups and the balls just moved <laughs> throughout them. And then all of a yeah. sudden they'll reveal one, like, oh, look, it's a game. <laughs> Put it back in, move them yeah. around. Um, I, I don't mean to say that these are bad games that they've produced or anything like that it's just i haven't heard of them hmm. so I, i'm not that's why i'm not sure how impactful this news actually would be to stadia i mean it's potentially more games that's a good thing hmm, yeah, so yeah yeah i'm yeah. i'm familiar with new world interactive um i'm trying to have a quick look through as to why i know Insurgent. new world interactive insurgency uh, yeah Dave not me. insurgency yeah not insurgency Save. Oh, no, that's Saber Interactive. That, that's the parent company. Yeah, yeah, perhaps, perhaps. perhaps. <laughs> I'm I've scrolling the down the, some yeah, I was just scrolling down the website, and that's... yeah. So if we look at four games in particular, like I said, they do the Metro franchise, and the the long term developer with the publisher Deep Silver. So they've got uh, 150 staff working on it. So that they are kind of like a triple A, triple A. Yeah. In personal opinion, double A, two triple A. They're in that like middle ground between it. Um, but we know they've just had Metro Exodus came out uh, last year, so now the focus is surely going to be on that next title. Personally, I would like to see them move away from the Metro franchise and do something a little bit different. Uh, and it does look in the in their brief uh, kind of press release they put up there is they're going to be working on a new AAA property uh, from that team, which is going to leverage the experience from working on the Metro franchise. So most yeah. likely a, a first-person shooter. I hope they take a totally different D2 and make something new and exciting because uh, I do enjoy seeing a, a fresh new IP but well, hopefully the one just get absorbed it's entirely possible the reason they've bought these studios is so they can work in collaboration with each other mm. so you could have 4A games effectively because they've got these other smaller studios it could almost effectively increase the amount of people they have by leasing out internally parts of the game development to other studios yeah, I think that's certainly something that in terms of business deals like this, that that, yeah. that might be more what we're yeah. looking at here. We're looking essentially at an umbrella corporation. Yeah. Not not the same umbrella corporation, not, of course. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, not that one. Please, not, not that, that one. one. If you're working on that one, stop. <laughs> <laughs> we're already dealing with one virus as is. <laughs> we are indeed. Um, Let's not bring the T-virus into this. <laughs> in terms of THQ Nordic, I really just want them to get that time splitters game out. I've been I've been going on about it for so long. There's a Time Splitters Rewind, which is a fan made one using Unreal Engine. Uh, that's been in the works for what feels like an eternity now, and they give like an annual update because it's such a small group of people working on it part time. But they own the IP, so just ah, oh, come on, come on, guys, come on, THQ, embrace a group, do something with your fifty thousand um... studios. I'm wondering whether Embracer is sort of like buying up all these studios so they can actually create their sort of like em Embracer cinematic universe type <laughs> Super Smash, Smash Brothers, Brothers type thing. I'd They've got it. Darksiders, you know, if you talk about THQ Nordic, uh, Darksiders, SpongeBob, <laughs> destroy all humans. What a like roster. it could be some sort of, yeah. yeah. It wouldn't stand up though, let's be honest. <laughs> I mean, what would you even call it? Who knows? Who knows? I don't know. But <laughs> I really don't. No idea. It's entirely possible that there's going to be a lot of mergers going on between these mm. sort of, these companies as well. It, it's really hard to say. Like it, announcing you've just bought eight studios in one go is kind of odd. It's it's a bit of a it's a bit of a like here's my big dick energy kind of flexing <laughs> on other studios, isn't it? Really, like, look what we've done. Yeah. Your movie, eh? Yeah, it, it we does... don't have a big dick, but we have eight small ones. <laughs> Octo dick. <laughs> Octo dick. 
that's a that's a game on play. Oh no, that's Octo Dad. No, it's Octo Dad. <laughs> it's a very I mean, different game. <laughs> let's be honest. I'm sure yeah, Octo Dad's got that big dick energy as well. Octo Dad's a great game. Great game. Yeah, is that published yeah. by THQ? Yes. It wouldn't surprise me. <laughs> it would not surprise me. Uh, but speaking of speaking of games coming potentially to Stadia in the future or, or otherwise, uh, we've got uh, two new games got rated by. Uh, it was the. German's rating board, the USK, so not ESRB. Uh, one again, one of these other rating boards which grades games, which is why Stadia app and xCloud should be allowed on Apple because they're rated, they're, they're governed by this overarching thing. Uh, from Devolver Digital, which we know we've got a few games now trickling through to Stadia, uh, we've got Hotline Miami and the sequel, Hotline Miami 2, wrong number, rated for Stadia. Um, they were rated on the 28th of July, uh, respectively. So we've got those um, most likely 100% incoming. We've seen these ratings be very, very critical uh, and factual before. Uh, either of you two had a chance to check out the Hotline Miami games previously, and what are your thoughts? I'll go to you, Tom, first, because you're nodding away. Yeah, yep. Yeah, played the first one. I think I picked it up on Switch, of all things. Mm. Um, it was Switch. Um, oh, or was it actually on PS Vita? Could have been I, on the I would Vita, have thought Vita would. I Rest had it on pace. Vita. Yeah, I remember having it on a handheld device, on something I could play handheld. Well, um, it's been quite a while since I've played it, but yeah, I, I enjoyed it. I like that sort of... Um, it's a throwback to like the original GTAs, isn't it? That top-down sort mm -hmm. of um, 2D, top-down shooting, moving yeah. through rooms and so on. I like it. It's yeah. a bit of fun. Well, it reminds me of um, my, uh, my uncle had a uh, Sega Dreamcast of all consoles and when we used to go on his he only had three games one was uh like virtual racer or something he had casper the friendly ghost and he had a game called loaded or okay. reloaded or something it may have been where it was very much a top down uh, you got keys to go into certain rooms and you had a, a, a squad of, i think there was about two two three four maybe co-op and you basically just like shot like said grand theft auto bird's eye view style and so the, the the characters were just basically shoulders in a circle for a head and then a, a stick for a gun um but you went around collected ammo collected weapons grenades and stuff and basically just just mowed through uh tons of enemies on and this is essentially what hotline miami is it's set in 1989 miami it's got really cool kind of synth pop 80s beaty music it's really vibrant it, it ticks over nicely um I, I love the original. I never had a chance to play number two. Um, for those of you who've just played through The Last of Us Part 2, you'll notice Hotline Miami actually makes an appearance on a PlayStation Vita within the world of The Last of Us. So it's <laughs> it's not dead, Richie. It's still going in the post-apocalyptic world of yep. whatever, 2035, whatever it may be. Um, I'm excited for it. It's been a while. Um it wouldn't surprise me if it's a pro game, in all honesty, just because of the age of the game, yeah. the size and scope of the game. It, it don't even I think is a brand new indie title. It was only ever fifteen to twenty pound range. So it's, it, if it's that niche pro, it's a perfect pro, yeah. pro game, in my opinion, it's very very well re received. Um, it's a small a smaller title. Yeah, it's it, it's good. It's a good game, and it, it just shows it as well. This is something I know a lot of people are not fond of, but shows Stadia's commitment to getting these well beloved indie titles yeah on the platform to fill out the back catalog yeah definitely which I'm i think all that's what we need to we need to look at that really don't we yeah we need to consider the fact that this is this seems to be the move that they're taking now in terms of indie games they're this this i won't say they're straying away from the lesser known ones because getting less known on the platform is still good for exposure mm -hmm. but they're definitely trying to hit the indie the indie crowd in terms of getting the big indie title names now. yeah I mean, Hotline Miami, the original one, it got plenty of, um, I think it was 2012 Game of the Year nominations, so it was one of the ones up there with the ones at the time. Personally, I, think I just it's think it's what they I need to I think IGN do. rated it as a 10. Wonderful. So, so that's that's the level of game we're talking about. Yeah. Swish. Oh, the... uh, Machinima was 95 out of 100. Um, You're watching the trailer, aren't you? I am, yeah. yeah. So what we need right now, <laughs> all we need right now is Fall Guys. Make it happen. Oh well, we'll be talking about that in our post show, no doubt. Games uh, that stay that we would like to see on Stadia because there's been a lot of rumours this week around some games that may or may not be coming to Stadia from leaks and reports and stuff like that. But we'll we'll talk about that more when we've got a more concrete. When we've got an ESRB German ratings board <laughs> locked in, that's when we'll really go in depth and talk about. I'm it. surprised. But, I thought like Peggy was a pan European rating board. I thought that was kind of the point, but I Peggy. didn't realize there would be a separate one for Germany. Yeah, well, apparently there is. I mean, we've got the BBFC in the UK as well. So I mean, I know it's mm. 
film classification. I, but I suppose they Peggy is probably things. dealing with European law where the individual countries are their laws beyond that. Hmm. Do you think the yeah. same guy does the voiceover for all of them? So, you know, like the Peggy 18, Peggy 12. Do you think he does, like, the German board and every other one as well? <laughs> you, you, you ask, yeah. <laughs> yeah. He probably, he probably did, it's just like one recording session where he just did all the ratings boards and all the ratings in one go. <laughs> yeah, Peggy 16, Peggy 18. Just gets in there with the German board as well. That's, it's nine rating. I don't know <laughs> what that is. Um, but Peggy's in terms of that, <laughs> Island's Fanzig, yeah, Peggy. That's eleven. I don't know. I'm just saying German numbers uh, now. Yeah. <laughs> this is a this is a predominantly English podcast, except for actually that's twenty one. Sorry, we get to Island's <laughs> Fanzig. Is, yeah, it is. You're right. Yeah. Anyway, anyway, well, that's that's for another yeah. discussion altogether. <laughs> How much German do you not know? Um, in terms of the games, though, we do know FIFA is coming. FIFA twenty one. We hope actually. I don't think that's officially been confirmed. At it's the, not con- confirmed, at the connected, but it was just be weird FIFA. If it wasn't. It'd be very weird if they came up with... Tw- Again, with it being annualised, it seems daft yeah. for them to work on an older game when they could just go it's, from this year It is forward. possible they do the, Nint- yeah, do the Nintendo move where they've ported, they ported like an older ver- an older version of the game, but they changed the squads to the newer version. So I think it might have been like 17 or something where it was like mm. the, the the version on Switch or get what you, whatever it was, the Wii U at the time, I think was like the previous years when they upgraded yeah. the engine. The, yeah, they did that on Vita and such, and that, that I think, predominantly was just down to the capabilities of the device. It, you couldn't iterate and get yeah. better and better year on year, so it was much cheaper yeah. and more efficient, and it was going to make op- the game... optimization yeah, optimized, as well yeah. for that. Um, whereas I think Stadia, yeah. it has the, the foresight benefit of always being like the best version you'd like to think. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm, my guess is it's going to be FIFA 21 we'll get. Yeah. And um, yeah, they've dropped some stuff this past week. So as we start to ramp up towards uh, the football season starting again, uh, we've seen some information drop around the career mode. Uh, and also the cross-play functionality, or lack thereof, I should say. So we can yeah. confirm FIFA 21 is not getting cross-play, disappointingly enough, with uh, other platforms, Ooh. which... Uh, that's de- including cross-generation play as well yeah it depends on your take personally the way I play FIFA I do love to jump into a bit of career yeah. mode and I enjoy playing it with friends I'm not one for the FUT seasons campaign mode that's no. all online uh, and I'm not really one for playing with strangers online I'd rather play with friends uh, competitively or otherwise or as a, as a team uh, so in terms of the crossplay, it doesn't really have an impact on me because I'm, I plan on getting it on Stadia yeah. and I plan on playing with the likes of Richie and anyone out there. I know I think... me and Chase have a game lined up, Orlando versus New York City yeah. FC. I'm, nice. I'm completely with you You there, Chris. I'm exactly the same. It's all about the career mode or couch corp for me, for FIFA. But I do think this is a bit of a blow for Stadia, who has by far the smallest user base, it not being cross-play. Mm. If you are big into the online features... You're probably not going to get. You're not going to get out on stage, yeah. Yeah, hmm. yeah. That's it's definitely going to hurt. Although one of the big things I would like to see with the mentioning around uh, career mode and stuff, we alluded to yeah. it last week, Richie. You talking about Football Manager? I would love the ability to jump in and do my training simulations, simulate some matches, pick my squads, do some transfers. All with just touchscreen controls on the go. Yeah. That will be phenomenal for me. Then I'll play my matches on the big screen at home. But then if I'm out and about on the move. The ability to customize and tweak stuff and, and put maybe requests in for transfers and purchases yeah. that'll be fantastic. So I'm, I'm looking forward to those two things kind of coming uh, coming to with a tandem the, with each other. Yeah, with the additional stuff they're putting they're putting into career mode this year, they seem to be focusing heavily on career mode, which is a lot. It's about probably about seven years overdue that they've done this. <laughs> I put a bit of effort into career mode, and I'm quite excited for it actually. So it's a lot of the stuff I've been wanting for. Part of it is almost like a half step towards a football manager where yeah. you get a lot more stuff. You don't, where instead of before, if you didn't, you could just sim games and it's just like, oh, he's a screen. Oh, you lost 2 1. <laughs> now you actually can in, in, influence the game tactically, effectively play as the manager. Oh, and then you can also jump in and out of the game, which looks pretty cool, to be honest. Mm. I'm all for this, these changes to Cree mode. So, yeah, it's interesting stuff to. It's to... a definite buy for me. Yeah, same. I, I missed last year's FIFA, so it's, I'm hoping they've iterated with an extra year, and I know the career mode got a bit of a backlash uh, on last year's iteration because it was practically broken on launch. 
There was less in it than the previous years. Yeah, so I think this is this has forced them to really double down and just make it a, an exciting aspect of the FIFA. Well, there you go, EA execs. We know you're listening out there. You've at least got two people purchasing it on Stadia, so let's make yeah. sure it happens. Yeah, let's make sure. Are you not jumping in, Tom? You know. I'm I'm not I've never been that big on football. Um I, I haven't played a FIFA game since probably I want to say like 16 probably. It's mm-hmm. been it's been it's been a number of years now. Not much has changed. But, no, I wouldn't <laughs> expect it to, but but um football or soccer for our American viewers has never really been like my 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 sort of sport of choice personally. Um, I've always been a bit more out there with things like um like the ice hockey and so on as well, which um <laughs> From from EA's perspective, I don't I don't believe they're actually releasing. We haven't had any more information about NHL 21. In fact, I actually think that's been delayed um, simply because of everything that's gone on. They've sort of like taken the regs out of that basket and put it elsewhere. Mm. So yeah, I'd be intrigued to see if we get uh, MLB the Show because that's mm. they've recently just stopped being PlayStation exclusive and they've announced going forward they go even though it's made by a PlayStation owned studio. It's going to be open on other platforms as well, such as Xbox and PC. So it'd be interesting if Stadia falls into that caveat, or if it is maybe just too much yeah. work for a, a PlayStation Hunt studio at the end of the day. But we are starting to see that cross pollination coming alive, and I think, yeah, as gaming does move more towards the cloud, I can see. I mean, we saw it with Horizon Zero Dawn coming to PC, Death Stranding. I think there is a lot of room for this cross pollination. If again, businesses go where the money is. So if you've got a platform of X amount of people, why wouldn't you put your game there? So interesting stuff speaking of more new games as well we did allude to it slightly last week but we've had a little bit more trickle out regarding uh, dc and what the world of batman and his um colorful cast of enemies are up to uh, we got confirmation this week that at the dc fandom event taking place later this month on the 22nd uh, of august we're going to pretty much hear about the game announcements and finally finally find out what wb have been up to behind the scenes and rocksteady have been up to so <laughs> Um, if I'm right, the, it's called Suicide Squad Killer Justice League is the title for the Rocksteady game and WB Montreal's that long tease Court of Owls game is going to be Gotham Knights so not Court of Owls, Gotham Knights now so, thoughts? I wonder if Gotham Knights is going to be a, se- a sequel to the Arkham series but not playing as Batman so set in the same world hmm. so the- wasn't the last one Arkham Knight? Yes, that was the And the fact one. that it's plural suggests probably multiple characters. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, the, the Batman games, by the end of it, you could play as Catwoman, you could play as Robin, and the DLC sub- subsequently yeah. let you play as a few of the characters, but never in like the main campaign. It was always Batman predominantly. Um, yeah, I wonder if that's going to be a bit more of a heavier focus on the cast of characters where rather than having Batman and side characters. Yeah, the I wonder if they're actually going for more of like if you think about like the Marvel Avengers style approach to it and basically yeah. saying like you you have your missions but you have your choice of characters to approach the missions from different yeah. angles or perhaps even that you can just um drop in and out of almost like a you know a a a fully fluid world open world where you, you know, all the different characters, if you think a la GTA 5, you've got your characters out there in the world doing their own things, but you can mm-hmm. jump into them for, for missions and so on. I don't yeah. know. No, um, I think you're right there, Tom. I think what, what one of the heavily rumoured things has been is that one of them is going to be a squad-based game, similar to Destiny mm-hmm. a la the new upcoming Avengers game, which we'll, we'll talk about briefly. And again, the, the cast of uh, villains, like the hall of villains that essentially Batman has, I think is phenomenal. <clears throat> part, of, part of the reason I really enjoyed the Arkham games is I think all of the villains in Batman have such a deep uh, lore behind them and interesting quirks, you know, like when you vary from Scarecrow to Penguin to Killer Croc and stuff, there's such a variation in villains and they're also likeable in their own way, which is, I think, why things like Suicide Squad is even a thing because the, the cast of characters are so different and varied it, they've it's got a great. Of char- charisma behind them they're yeah, not completely. just they're not just very generic characters there's actual character yeah in there. i mean i would take when you look at some of the, uh, the marvel stuff that puts out some of the the b-list villains they try and drag out and i mean even just like down to watching like the the movies iron man 3 and the mandarin like the the mandarin i'd never even heard of him before the movie and then in the movie they decide to do a lovely twist as well yeah. but if you name me batman villains like um the Joker and stuff like there's so many more you can throw out there. Um, Deadshot well, and think, the likes of that, it's, it's wonderful. 
I mean, it's a completely different podcast, but I think the um, biggest failures of the DCEU was they just didn't develop the characters. They boil them down to one or two traits and just yeah. chuck them into almost like a late game story where you're expected to know Batman's backstory massively mm-hmm. before Justice League yeah. without ever really being on that journey with him. It was certainly rushed, but unlike things yeah. that are rushed, this stuff's been cooking at Rocksteady and cooking at WB Montreal for what for feels a like a half, half a decade, if not yeah. probably at this point. <laughs> I feel like I played Arkham Knight a lifetime ago when, now, and Arkham Origins even Knight longer. Go, I Arkham guess Knight like 2015, 16-ish. Oh, Ricky. Let's have a look. You typed it um, away. 2015. 2015, so wow. yeah, five years, which is crazy. Half a decade um, ago. And again, when we get the announcement of DC Fandom, that doesn't tell us it's coming out then. We might still have to wait till into 2021, yeah. so that's a long time in development. So all that tells me is that we've got some big games on the horizon, which I'm looking forward to, and we know WB have that relationship with Stadia. We've not seen anything of it yet. But we know it's in the pipeline, so fingers crossed we're going to get this announced and we're going to get another day and day triple A big hitting title for Stadia hopefully coming mm-hmm. soon. Um, moving on, then we'll move into some different aspects of news this week. Um, before we jump onto that, I do want to talk about uh, the only on Stadia plan. So we opened up a segment, I think it was last week, called <laughs> Only on Stadia. And this is oh, this God. is shit that could only happen on Stadia that we <clears throat> we want to have a little laugh about a little jovial chuckle, if you will. So this week, YouTube Gaming, I think Ed, I saw Eddie comment on it and tweet it back out. Um, they they came out on the the YouTube Gaming channel uh, asking which one of these platforms you choose for crossplay, and it was a, a four segmented panel collage of photos. Top left, DualShock Four. Top right, Xbox controller. Bottom left, two Nintendo Joy-Cons. And bottom right, keyboard and mouse. Now, gentlemen, which which particular platform of gaming is missing from that list that they actually own? This one. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> you, audio listeners, I'm holding up my, um, my Stadia controller. You, yeah, you can't really write this shit, can you? But only, only I, Google would forget their own platform when promoting... Gaming and crossplay. It just shows the disconnect within Google as an, as a corporation. It's like I know YouTube Gaming is a separate company to Stadia, but you at least think like the like this just shows that they're probably not even considering Stadia. It's like it should be the top left. It, it, well, like, I mean, sorry, yeah, Tom, you're probably going to say. I was going to say, interestingly, they we did get a response from um, from YouTube Gaming themselves as well, saying that they are a you know, they are a platform that doesn't buy us in any way whatsoever. But I still don't think it excuses them from not including their yeah, own. If you're not yeah. biased, that should have everything there. I yeah, want like, N64 controllers. <laughs> I want to see a bloody, like, joystick and a steering wheel as well yeah, on there. If, but... if you're not biased, they show, like, generic Mad Cats controllers. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's a throwback. Um, but it's just one <laughs> of those... Use? Yeah, it's just one of those only on steady and laughable moments that they would forget their own... Yeah. division um and, and again a second uh, add-on to that is when you go on the youtube website the icon for youtube gaming is a stadia controller so it's integrated to some degree but it just baffles me that somebody over who runs the youtube gaming account doesn't think to maybe put your own product at first and foremost and then because yeah. this is the type of like subliminal marketing you need your product in the public mind's eye alongside these these other big hitters to make it become a yeah. viable product. If you're not talking about it on your own storefront, like Apple and Google, we were talking about earlier in the show, it's just a free opportunity to make you look like you can stand up against the big boys and not having your presence there just makes memes and gifs and people sharing it and people commenting on the Twitter thread going, uh, Google, you forgot about your own platform there. You, you're being detrimental yeah. to your own product, looks... whether yeah. intentional if, if or not. If they had the Stadia controller on there, Anyway, instead of like say the mouse and keyboard, there's going to be people calling them out for bias, but that's inevitable. And I think it's still better than not having it there. And then, yeah. then they're always discussing on the podcast, like, what the fuck? <laughs> yeah, but again, a laughable point, and only yeah, on oh Stadia, God. only on Stadia for now. A uh, few final points of note for this week's news before we wrap up. We got some APK breakdown features as well that are coming to the app. So it looks like we're going to be getting pre ordering. Uh, we know we can do it on Destiny, or we could do it for Destiny. It was the idea the the next uh, couple of years worth of content popped available on there. Um, we've also seen uh, not only pre-ordering is due to go live, it looks like text messaging within the app. 
So we know it's finally coming! Finally, so you, <laughs> can, you can contact yeah. your stadia people. I, I don't think it's that big of a, a deal, a deal really. Um, yeah, there's a lot of people asking for it, so yeah, I'd say so. I would always just message you through WhatsApp or otherwise. I'm, still, yeah, I'm always, dream, I'm always seeing people in like the face in like the Facebook groups asking about what's the best way like to communicate with people on Stadia. So True. I'd say I suppose, it is a big yeah, deal. if you're not, <laughs> I suppose if you're not fortunate <laughs> enough to know the people you're playing with, it must be quite yeah. difficult to arrange something like. I actually take it for granted that when I want to play, I just message you guys in our joint group and just say. Let's jump on Discord for the voice chat because the stadia chat, but below par to say the least. Yeah, yeah. Um, we we have a Discord. We can just use yeah, we that can use that. Um, other features that are mentioned in that is uh, Stadia two point two nine is also going to come with a Stadia update for status. So obviously you've got online busy uh, at the moment. It looks like they're going to add extra ones in that comes under the category of looking for a party streaming, which would come in handy for us because there's several times we've been streaming and notifications start popping up midstream which yeah. is, it can, can be a distraction um but it would be great if it would just pop up saying yeah sounds of stadia is streaming spitlings or something like that and then it would prevent notifications okay. popping or yeah. coming through um looking for parties great as you mentioned there richie reaching out to people who you maybe don't know on a personal level and want to play a game yeah. just looking for a party i'm, I'm free i'm Facebook's playing whatever t- facebook's a terrible platform for that i'll get a notification from like the uk um, stadia group click on it and it was about a conversation happening 12 hours ago. Yeah. <laughs> or you click the link well, and it says something went wrong and you can't you can't actually yeah. play with it. Um, well, that's usually when someone's got rid of the post, that yeah, one. Yeah, true, true, true. Um, and then the final final point of call that I wanted to touch on this week, it's not necessarily Stadia specific, um, but it, it does really ring true uh, for my own personal gaming life, is uh, Remedy Control 505. I tweeted about it earlier. Have you froze, Tom? Tom's froze. We'll keep going. He He'll hasn't froze with that face, has he? he I, has. Think, I think he's Let's just, just keep going. No, he's staying still. He's staying still. Look at his eyes. No. I think he might no, have No, he's to definitely froze. froze. Wow, that is a that is a position to freeze in, isn't it, ladies and gentlemen? For audio viewers li- viewers, <laughs> listeners, uh, I can't really describe this face to you really. Um I, yeah, I don't even know. You'll have to check out the YouTube video to find out what the yeah. hell is going on. Over there, <laughs> point upwards, Richie. Let's just point at him. Yeah, that guy over there is froze. So just after that little technical mishap, Tom is back with us, or oh, he's disappeared. There he is. He was hiding <laughs> hey, under the back. table all he's along. Hiding all along. <laughs> hiding all along. He went to fix the internet, <laughs> which of course yeah. everyone keeps below the whole internet. Below, below yeah, the you whole keep the internet, internet underneath your desk. Yeah, yeah. he I kicked mean, it. That's the problem. Yeah, he kicked it. It's in. It's in Richie's. It's in Richie's cube. <laughs> that's oh, it. It's that's hidden why. down there. Pass on the internet. I saw your feet come through the ceiling. Pass the internet back up. But yes, just to, to talk about that, we were discussing control. <laughs> And uh, the lack thereof of future planning for next gen. So this is Stadia specific because I think it could come to Stadia with it being one of those last game of the year uh, nominations. Ooh, okay. um, if you think about, it, we've got Sekiro, uh, we've got Hotline Miami, which is a 2012 nomination. Uh, what else have we got that's coming? That's game of the year. Oh, Jedi Fallen Order as well. So there's quite a yep. couple of games, and I think Control fits into that bracket of an older title, but one that probably could be ported quite well to stadia and i think remedy in particular are quite open with these kind of things so in regards to controller the really thing that knocked me off this week was the deluxe edition you can buy in all its entirety like i was just saying to richie there you can buy um control all of bells and whistles including all the dlc season pass content uh, as a new bundled up deluxe edition which comes with, if you buy the Deluxe Edition, a free port over to Next Gen. So if you have a PS5, an Xbox Series X, or potentially Stadia in the future, you get that next iteration included. The thing that really gets under my skin is I was an early adopter of Control. I pre-ordered it. I had it day one. I paid full price for it. I also, because I enjoyed the game so much, it was one of my Game of the Year uh, discussional ones last year, I also bought the season pass for full price and I've got one and the second one is just about to drop with Alan Wake this month. Looking forward to jumping back in. However, I, as an early adopter, have paid full price. I do not get a free upgrade to next gen. I have to buy the deluxe edition for full price once again to get that benefit. So as someone who's paid more, who's been a bigger supporter, a bigger fan of the game, I've got the platinum trophy in it as well on PlayStation... The reward I get for that is I have to buy it all again for 40 quid just to get the next gen version. Yep. Business practices, yeah, ladies and gentlemen. I, it, it's that's kind of bullshit, to be honest. Um, 
Initially, I didn't realise that if you had if you bought the season pass, you didn't get the upgrade. To be honest, at first, so at first I was thinking like, that's a bit crappy. That if you've bought the game, you're not getting the free upgrade. But I wouldn't have been expecting it. Mm-hmm. But if you've bought the season pass, basically you've got the uh, ultimate edition anyway, just not in name. Yep, that, that sucks. Like, Let's be real. This decision, though, hasn't been made by Remedy themselves. This will be five or five yeah, games will published be. who yeah. will make that decision. So no hate needs to be directed towards Remedy. Remedy being a fantastic company, have done yeah. some incredible things with their games. But it's it, yeah, it's it's crappy business practices by the likes of Five or Five by the publishers that just want that extra bit of cash. Yeah. Again, I just think way we it, can make a bit more money. Yeah. It just mm. conditions you though to think just wait. So if I didn't buy the game and support it day one, if I didn't buy the season yeah. pass, I could have waited just under a year, bought the deluxe edition for £20 less, and then I get more for less. Like, what kind of way is that to support your audience, support your crowd, mm. essentially? It just makes me think, like, when they bring out the next game, why would I buy it day one when I could just wait and get the better, like, superior version for £20 less? Yeah. It's just a... It's, I, know it's, it's, I understand why these things happen. I just think it's just not great. But I will it's buy not, it on Stadia if it comes out on Stadia because it's a phenomenal game. And like I said to Remedy, no disrespect like them, they've made a great game. I hope it comes out on Stadia because there's one I, I've missed. And if it comes out on Stadia, that's probably when I'll be more motivated to buy it. Exactly. Um, but that brings us to an end of all the world and all the joys of Stadia. All the world. Okay. All the <laughs> world. That brings an end yeah, to the world. world. <laughs> I don't get an upgrade in yeah. control of the world. It's going there, right? Stop this podcast. <laughs> ring, your love, ring your loved ones. To <laughs> <laughs> tell them how you really feel. <laughs> that that date that you've wanted to uh, ask out for many, many months, go do it. Because this podcast and the world is apparently about to end. Um, but no, that brings us to an end of episode 47 of the Sounds of Stadia podcast. The longest running UK Stadia podcast in the world, uh, brought to my se- brought to you by myself, Chris, my lovely co-hosts Tom and Richie, uh, and do not forget to subscribe to the channel so you are kept in the loop with all of our episodes that go up. But more importantly, all of our live streams, content, unboxings, Tom's review of Kishi and using Android devices, Richie's beard, and much much more every week over on the Sounds of Stadia channel. Also, don't forget our lovely patrons out there. Thanks for stopping by. Patreon.com forward slash Sounds of Stadia where you can sub to our channel for as little as Uno dollar or 79 pence and that gets you exclusive content and more importantly the post show after this where we're about to head off and we're going to talk about all the games we would like to see coming to Stadia in a bit more in-depth discussion. So thank you for tuning in. Uh, my name's been Chris. You can find me at CyberChris2077 over on Twitter. I've been Tom. You can find me at, at AdaxisLP over on Twitter. I've been Richie, and I'm at RichieC89, and I'm a little annoyed at Chris for changing up the outro. <laughs> <laughs> Me too, mate. Me too. <laughs> and I also don't care, at Sounds of Stadia <laughs> on Twitter. <laughs> Thanks for watching, everyone. Have a great week in gaming. Take care. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Bye.